Okay, we're ready to start. This is one of those uh, sub-lectures, uh, since I've been getting a lot of questions about secretagogue technology, uh, I'm just going to go to it now and then go to um, the somatostatin uh, somatopause. Um, option to treatment, uh, you know, the key to any good practice is that we have lots of options, that we just don't have one pathway. Sublingual testosterone, rectal testosterone, vaginal testosterone, topical, injectable. It's about having lots of options. And this is just a option. And, you know, noting it as a responsible first step in growth hormone therapy because cost issues, um, government issues, uh, and uh, if a product has a potential of working in 92% of the cases, I mean, you want a needle? Do you want uh, the cost? There's an option. Okay, everyone knows Skrigog is a substance that causes another substance to be secreted. And in this particular situation, it's growth hormone releasing factor or growth, growth hormone releasing hormone yielding growth hormone. And regulation of growth hormone secretion is a positive feedback, which is um, uh, caused by growth hormone releasing hormone with increase in growth hormone releasing receptor sensitivity and increased production of growth hormone. Negative feedback, which is somatostatin, now called somatotropic releasing inhibiting factor, which actually decreases the number of growth hormone releasing receptor sensitivity and decreases the somatotropes' ability to release growth hormone. So it's this balance in the body that we can't forget when we're using secretagogues because they don't push aside the regulatory mechanism like injectable growth hormone does. They work within the regulatory mechanism. So if you use too much of um, a product, uh, secretagogue, it will downregulate the process and you get a negative return. Well, looking at the natural production of growth hormone, we see in young uh, individuals in the A that the number of pulses and the amplitude and duration of the pulse are much greater. As we get older, you see that it tends to decrease, although it's still there. It's still present, the pulses. So the question is, as we get older, is this loss in the magnitude and duration of uh, amplitude and duration or the frequency of the um, growth hormone production, is it due to a dysregulation between the growth hormone releasing hormone and somatostatin or somatotropic releasing inhibiting factor? SS is the old term for it. This is uh, you know, a question that came up and we're looking at it now. Um, in, as I said, the regulatory mechanism, you can overload it by using too much of a, sec a secretagogue or a product. And overstimulation, this is what you see. In the ideal dosing on the left side, you see you get these great peaks in the use in the morning and in the evening of a secretagogue, whatever one that is. And at um, the second one, if you use too much what happens is you get a down-regulating, so you get a negative return. So it's about finding that window of ideal dosing of a secretagogue in order to get the maximal response without self-down-regulating. So this is truly a situation where less is more. So some of you heard my uh, dialogue a little earlier about um, Within two injections of uh, injectable growth hormone, obviously, there's a 40% decrease in intrinsic production of growth hormone. And over time, I think it's about 30 days, what happens is your natural intrinsic native, we'll call it native production of growth hormone, is now down to zero. So where is all that growth hormone that we're now measuring coming from? The responsibility is what you're injecting. So it would be ideal to find a system, find a way where you can preserve your natural production of uh, growth hormone, still use injectable growth hormone at the same time, or not to use injectable and use a product that um, has the ability to increase growth hormone when used within that window so that you don't suppress 
the production. This is, I've been referring to this 98 pages, this phenomenal study on uh, neuroendocrinology that just looks at growth hormone regulatory mechanisms with cortisol, thyroid, with growth hormone releasing factor. It's the neuroendocrine control of growth hormone secretion. It was a 1999 article, uh, 28, 98 pages. Phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. If anybody wants to read it, um, I'll send you a copy of it. It's in PDF format. So homeostasis of growth hormone, obviously um, somatostatin and growth hormone, just reiteration for some reason. And the intrinsic level of uh, growth hormone, IGF-1 and binding protein, is diurnal. It fluctuates up and down. Yes, the greatest amount is at night between 8 or 10, depending upon who you read, until 4 to 6 in the morning. And it's always this balance that has to be maintained, and we're focusing in on the fact of secretagogues. And a secretagogue can be arginine, a secretagogue can be GABA, a secretagogue can be uh, orthoketoglutamine, uh, pyroglutamine. Uh, there's a whole bunch of products that fit into it, as well as a 29 peptide growth hormone releasing hormone, or a hexa, uh, hexapeptide, hexarone's the one, hexapeptide. These are all in the family of secretagogues that go and interact with the receptors in the brain or through secondary mechanisms like um, using uh, the velva uh, bean, which is also mucopa uh, prurins, which is dopamine, uh, using the DR2 receptors, dopamine receptor 2, which when you stimulate dopamine receptors 2, you get an increase in growth hormone. Melatonin increases. These are all forms of secretagogues.